Hello, John Talley here with Partzilla.com, and welcome back to the studio for another live event, if you want to call it that, at 3 o'clock on Friday. I just want to take a couple of seconds and, well, remember what happened 19 years ago on this date. Uh, it, was a, it was a tough time, and I know exactly where I was when that happened, but just take a few seconds and let's remember all those that were taken away from us, whether they had been in the towers at the Pentagon or on that Flight 93 and the first responders that tried so de desperately to help. My thoughts and prayers uh, still go out to their remaining family and friends that uh, were affected by that so long ago. All right, well, on to a little bit more happy news. Going to spend a little bit of time answering a few questions, as you can see. Don't have Garrett with me, so guess what? I guess we're flying solo today. Looks like we've got a fair amount of questions starting to filter through, so go ahead and send them in, and I'll do my best to answer them. All right, the first one from Fadi. He wants to know when we're going to get back to international shipping. That is a common question. Believe me, as soon as they, the government allows us to do so, I'm sure we will be on it as quickly as possible. It's really not up to us. It has to do with the international policies that are in place right now because of COVID-19, of course. But as soon as they uh, release us, we will be shipping out to you as quickly as we can. Mike sent in a question. Hi, John. What is a good sign of a CV joint on a Polaris 570 Sportsman going bad? Well, a good sign well, is actually be a bad sign, but what typically signifies one is going bad is you're going to hear a clicking, especially when you're turning it, if it's up front. When it gets that extra bind, when you're actually trying to make a turn, that's typically when you'll hear it make that click, 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 click sound. And the other thing, just look at the boots, because that's what typically takes them out is the boot gets ripped. You can't really see it until you start pulling back that accordion. But what happens, it gets ripped, water and mud get in there. They start to wear out the bearings and the, uh, the surface areas much quicker than they should be. And then you're going to end up having to re uh, rebuild it or replace it. Uh, Nick, as far as the shipping to Canada, I don't know, but I bet you our, our team down in Florida can answer that question for you. But I would imagine the same rules of, apply to uh, Canada as they do international, and I consider international across the pond, so to speak. Yeah, and they did provide. They, they don't have a, a shipping date just yet. All right, Dennis is asking me, I have a 2004 Sportsman 400 that has an intermittent squeal in the front end when you apply the gas. Even with the hubs disengaged and before the wheels rotate, really? That's interesting because when I first started reading through there, I was thinking of bearing because typically when a, a wheel bearing goes bad, they, they actually start squealing. And uh, it's a very distinct metal grinding sound that uh, you don't easily forget. But you're saying that it's before the wheels rotate, and you're sure it's coming from the front end? I mean, because that would imply that nothing is moving yet, and yet you're hearing the squealing sounds. That makes me wonder if it's the belt maybe starting to squeak. Maybe the sheaves are starting to get a little bit gla or glazed, and they're starting to squeak when they're trying to engage on the belt. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably look there first and just listen a little bit more carefully to see if that's indeed where the sound is coming from. All right, Isaiah's asked me, what can I do to get the pin out of the U-joint on a Polaris Ranger 570? It is stuck. I know what you're talking about. All these U-joints, well, they're basically made the same way. And if you've been watching us transmit from this particular studio, there's been a Yamaha YXZ1000R behind us. And of course, it's been disassembled. It's actually sitting outside now. But at any rate, getting those U-joints pulled apart was not a lot of fun, and they actually make a tool, I believe K&L makes it, where it mounts on either side of the yoke itself and it pushes the pin through. Now you might be able to get it knocked out with a hammer, but if you're dealing with it on the machine, you're not going to have a whole lot of room to strike it with, so you may want to investigate one of those tools. I've also seen them at a couple of different auto parts stores, and I believe they have one small enough to get down to the size you're talking about. Now, they're really made for you know, like a, a, a car-type drive shaft with the U-joints, um, but I think they make one small enough, small enough to deal with your application. So, once again, it's just going to take raw pressure to push that through. 
what else do we have here? And Jerry's asking me, hey there, I have a question about a 2012 KX450F. My clutch, basket, and hub are worn. It's currently a recluse clutch, um, EXP20. Would you rebuild the recluse or just go back to an OEM, OEM clutch? That's just a really a matter of preference for you. Um, I know a lot of the pro racers, they love the recluse because it uh, essentially eliminates them and stalling the engine. I mean, they're all pros, but still things happen at a really fast pace out there. And that way they don't have to worry about if they can't quite get to that clutch lever, the engine, you know, stop and stopping and then and then they're sitting duck there out there on the track. But it really, it boils down to what do you feel more comfortable riding with? Me, I've always had just a standard clutch. And the recluse, if anything, that would probably throw me off. So it's really up to you. Which way do you prefer? As far as it wearing out sooner or later, the recluse really shouldn't have any, uh, it shouldn't have any bearing on that. The clutch basket getting worn that quickly. Uh, well, it's a 2012, it was probably time. But it's up to you as to which way you wanna go. Me, I'm gonna stay with the standard stuff. All right, Dennis did comment back. He had the, uh, the 570, he said yes, and when the power is first applied and has a new belt. Okay, it has a new belt, but did you actually look at the sheaves themselves and did you feel their bearings that they're riding on? Because once again, they're constantly moving for the most part. And if you're telling me you hit the throttle and you can hear it squeal, it's probably gonna be coming from that general area. So let's look a little bit closer, take a look at those bearings and the surface of the sheaves themselves. And I think we did a video that actually shows uh, an inspection and what to look for when you're, you're trying to evaluate the, uh, the sheaves as to whether or not they may, na may need to be replaced and or if they have a, uh, like a, a real glossy sheen to them, you may need to go back with maybe some 800 grit sandpaper and just take that edge off where they'll grab to the belt more effectively. So go back and take a peek, then let me know. Uh, somebody's just telling us thanks because they were able to get parts for their GS500 and uh, they were not available in uh, your country. Well, I'm glad we could help. Josh is asking me, he's got a 2006 250EX, I believe that's a Kawasaki, or oh, or are you talking about a Honda um, TRX? Uh, at any rate, does the clutch need maintenance? Well, that's a kind of a double-edged question. As far as maintenance, do you need to adjust it every so often? Well, yes, because as a uh, clutch starts, uh, starts to wear, it's engagement point with your warehouse is having fun this afternoon. Go get the airsoft gun. Let's pop that guy in the head. <laughs> As the clutch wears, the the uh, the stack, as I call it, starts to get thinner and thinner, and your engagement point is going to change where your clutch actually engages and disengages. And that's going to be important because as it wears, you're going to need to pull it further in, so to speak. And if you haven't adjusted your arm correctly, well, then that's going to put extra stress on your transmission because the clutch won't be disengaged all the way. Other than that, as far as maintenance, it's going to let you know when it's time to get replaced. When you run out of adjustment, either on your handlebar or on the cable itself, well, your clutch set is done. And it's only a matter of time before it starts slipping. So when you are getting close to running out of adjustment, go ahead and plan on having a clutch rebuilt. All right, Isaiah is asking, oh, we tried an air hammer, still nothing. Sometimes just that instantaneous hit is great with breaking loose, you know, nuts or bolts or screws, and that's what an impact, you know, type device is really made to do. But what you're looking for is sustained pressure to force that pin out. But if they keep honking the horn, would you walk around the corner and th go throw something at them? <laughs> We have a light outside the studio that tells them, evidently, to make more noise. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Oh, so Jose is asking me, do more videos on a KFX 450R? Okay. I've got a CRF 450 I've got to do first, and it's actually going to be going on this table come Monday. Um, and shoot, we'll go ahead and put a KFX uh, on the wish list and I'll do some search, searching and see if I can bring one in. We haven't done one in 
why not do something different? I'm up for it. I was asked ask me one more question. Do they, does, do they, the pin, do they push out either direction or just one way? It should go either direction. Just make sure that there isn't a clip on either side to hold it in. There should be. And uh, make sure that they're pushed, uh, that it's been released before you try to push it out. All right, Bobby's asking me a chain question. I'm changing my chain and sprockets. The new chain came along as expected. Now my stock chain is 92 lengths and don't count the pins in the chain or the actual links themselves. It's the actual links themselves, but you can take, well, take your existing chain, your old chain, go ahead and count it and then lay yours next to it, count it as well, and you could actually lay them side by side. But keep in mind, your old chain is gonna be stretched probably a length or more, so <laughs> be careful not to cut your new chain to that length, otherwise it's not gonna fit right. Count the links, the actual links, the plates on the outside is what I usually go after, and then cut accordingly. Uh, Jose is wanting to know, he wants how to chain, check and maintain valves in the KFX450R. All right, we'll put it on the list and see if we can get that one recorded for you. Junior's dropping by to say hello, and again for the from the UK. Hello, hopefully things are going well for you today. And uh, shoot, it's probably, uh, you should be at a pub by now, because aren't you like six hours ahead of us? <laughs> All right, what else? Oh boy. <laughs> Johnny's asked me, he's got a 73 Hadaka Wombat 125. Y'all got any parts for those? No, we don't, and nobody else has for a long time. You're going to be relegated to looking on eBay for something like that. And good luck with it. Fun machine, though, wasn't it? Bobby Bell is asking me, I have an O3 LTZ 400 when releasing the clutch. It seems like I have to let the clutch all the way out further than needed. What would cause that? Well, that sounds like it's not adjusted correctly to me. I mean, your engagement point should be roughly half the throw of the clutch lever itself. And that, that seems to tell me that it is actually a little too tight and it's not disengaging until she's all the way out. Me, it's a personal preference, but I tend to want it to, to fully engage when it's roughly a half inch to three quarters at the end of the uh, actual clutch lever from being all the way released against the stop. That gives you a pretty good, bit, pretty good margin for, for error there. All right, Brittany's asking me, hi John, I want to add a PIA light to a Tenere 700. Do they wire in or do I need an additional fuse box? No and yes, uh, especially with a PIA light, regardless if it's a um, halogen or an LED, I'm betting it's probably an LED, you do not want to tax whatever machine you're installing this on with an additional amperage or load because the uh, manufacturers, they design those wires and those circuits and those fuses and those relays to deal with what the machine had on it when it rolled out of the factory. When you're adding something like this, it's two things you want to be aware of. One, you need to separate it electrically as far as the wiring goes from the factory system. Second of all, you need to make sure that your alternator or the generator on the side of it has enough amperage or enough charge to keep up with the regular vehicle use and then add in the, the load that you're adding into it because it has a job of running all the electronics and keeping your battery charged and whatever other lights are going on. Now if it does have that type of capacity, what you want to do is isolate it by one, adding a fuse, and two, you want to use a relay to actually tr relay the power from the battery through that fuse and then out to the light. Now, on a relay, you're going to have a trigger side, which is a low voltage or a low current coil size. And what it, that coil does is actually pull the inside of the, uh, the, the relay itself and essentially makes a contact. And it's just like flipping a switch. Now, that switch part of it that I'm talking about, you would actually tie into either a, a switch somewhere on the machine or you could even go in with the light switch on the, on the unit itself. So when you hit the, the high beam switch, you could actually tap into that particular wire, but it won't be sending power 
to the light from that particular wire, it will just be triggering the relay, which will then send the power to the, uh, the light itself. All right, this is an interesting one. Jay is asking me, 2015, what is the maintenance of an oil cooler? How often to flush? You know, I don't think it's ever really been discussed as to when you should actually flush out a, an oil cooler, but I'm, I'm a fan of that, especially on a sports bike where you typically go through clutches quicker because let's face it, the, in, the oil that's going through your engine is also getting thrown around those clutch plates, which are wearing at a, a pretty rapid pace in most cases. And all of that is getting passed through all those passages and the oil cooler is one of them. So I would, I would think every 5,000 miles on a sport bike would be a, a, a good time to go ahead and take it out, flush it out, and then you know, refill it with oil, get it primed, and then reinstall it. But that's just my personal opinion. Oh, he did tell me it was a 2015 R6. Go with that 5,000 five, uh, 5, mile rule. All right, Jerry's asking me, um, well, or continuing part of a conversation. Okay, I've always had a regular clutch myself, but it's so much cheaper to rebuild an OEM, but seeing the best options, seeing the best, I uh, love the way I uh, wanted to ask a question about the website. Is there anywhere you could, any way you could make it to where we add a machine to our profile and the parts for that machine would all auto-locate it? I like that. All right, Florida guys, you know who to get in touch with on that one. <laughs> That's out of my wheelhouse, but I like the way Jerry's thinking, so get to work on that. Good suggestion, Jerry. You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> All right, Mike is asking me, what is a good table to buy for home use? Oh, lift ATVs like the one you have in the shop. It's a nice one, by the way. This one is actually made by Handy Lifts, and they've been around forever, but they are kind of expensive. Now, I have seen some, let's call them aftermarket type lifts. It really depends on, are you trying to lift it that far up? I mean, you know, like at, at hip level, then you're gonna have to go with something like the Handy, if not the Handy itself. But I have seen some other aftermarket ones that may not have the lift capacity of this one that would probably be just fine for an ATV. Uh, one of my favorite lifts is actually uh, it's actually just a jack made by Craftsman. Instead of just having that one lift point, it has these two adjustable bars that fit under usually the center of the frame and lift it up. That may not be what you're looking for, but it's a lot cheaper than something like this handy lift. All right, what else do we have here? Vex is asking me, John, I'm experiencing a very loud howling when coming to a hard stop after installing D SDS pads on my GSXR L2, never had to copper grease the backs of uh, EBC pa pads before, any ideas? Brembo calipers. Yeah, what you're hearing is not so much what's going on on the backside, not the squealing. You're probably hearing what happens with a really high performance brake pad when you're not pushing it very hard. I've run into this with my track car before. If, <laughs> if I actually try to drive that car normally, oh, the brakes just make all kind of ungodly noises and it's, it, it's impossible to drive the car on the street. But if you're really in a race condition, they work very well. My suggestion, unless you're really pushing your machine that hard, I would probably steer away from those really aggressive type brake shoes. One, because they make all this noise, and two, they're very aggressive on your rotors or your, your uh, actual disc. They're gonna eat them two to three times faster than the OEM stuff. But once again, if you're really riding that hard, you probably wouldn't be hearing it make all that racket. So you may wanna consider coming away from those higher performance brake pads. Just a thought. All right, um, Paul Pavel is asking me, any tips for preload on replacement of the headstock bearing on a 2004 Honda CB599? If you're talking about the actual bearing inside of the, uh, the head or the, the front of the frame, there should be a torque value that you're going for, but to reach that, You'll, you'll torque it several times. Um, 
torque it down, move it back and forth, torque it down again, and then go ride it because as those bearings seat in, they will, it will get loose on you in a hurry unless you go through at least, I'd say, three torque cycles. It's a, let's say 200 miles, somewhere in that neighborhood to really get them set in there correctly. But there should be a, 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 a particular torque setting for that head bolt. And if the guys would maybe take a peek in the manual and see if they can answer by, before we finish up here, if not, I'll bring it up, see if I can come up with a value, and then uh, drop you a, uh, a message. And if I can't get in touch with you, I can just lead off with it next week, and uh, that way you'll know where to get it set to. All right. Screech. <laughs> Screech what, Brantley? Don't you have some studying to do or something? <laughs> Don't you have a test coming up that you need to really prepare for? All right, what else do we have here? Jay is asking me, hey, John, I'm thinking of buying a K8 Jixer, a oh, 2008 Jixer, but it has 45K on it. What do you think about a high kilometer bike? Well, as long as it's been maintained, I would rather have a bike with 50,000 maintained miles than one that's not been maintained for 5,000. That's what it boils down to. And you should be able to tell very quickly if this thing's been maintained correctly. I mean, look at your pivot points, especially on the rear swing arm. Put it up on its, on its side stand to see if you can rock the, uh, the swing arm. That's gonna tell you if there's, those bearings or those pivot points are worn. Do the same thing on the front end, see if there's any play on the steering. If all that's good, just listen to it when it's sitting there idling. It's going to tell you if it's been maintained proper, properly. If it's sitting there idling and just, just not even idling smooth and just jerking back and forth, you may want to walk away from it. And if the guy has records on it as far as everything that he's had done to it, bonus points. I mean, go ahead and go for it. But uh, let the feel of the bike guide you and not just the way it looks. Anybody can put on new plastic on a, on a beat-up machine and... You don't want to get caught in that in that snare. All right, what else do we have here? Hi, John. My YFZ 450 2005 SE WEN stopped for a week. Takes time to fire up. How do I clean the carb all the time? Please advise. So you're telling me it's been sitting up for a little bit and it just takes a while to fire up. Well. The carb isn't that complicated on that particular model, and uh, the closest one I think we have to it is, um, I think we did a, a carb clean on a CRF 450R. So take a peek at that, and I can walk you through the basics at least to go in and uh, clean up the carb. Apparently saying aggressive brake pads, yes, they will screech. So that's what you were talking about. <laughs> yes, it is Friday. All right, guys, what else do we have cooking here today? All right, Wayne's asked me, I have a 2003 Honda CBR 600 F4, and when you hit the starter button, the bike will start, but as soon as you let off the starter button, the engine cuts out. What could the problem be? Sounds to me like it's just getting spun over and it's never really starting. I mean, uh, I've seen them before. If you if you keep the starter engaged, it'll kind of sound like it's trying to start, but that really kind of sounds like it's just barely firing and it's not getting enough fuel. So I would start looking at the fuel system first, do a pressure test, see what we have there. Also, I'd be curious to know if it has any, any codes uh, that are popping on it right now. But I, I'd start by looking at the fuel system first. All right, I can't even pronounce your name. What are the symptoms of a bad fuel filter? Curious, mine some, tends to bog down some while I ride. Someone told me that the fuel filter, uh, or it could be the fuel injectors, any help would be appreciated. What did you ask that question at the right time? This has been one of our project bikes and I didn't follow my own advice. This machine had sat on the other side of that wall for, I hate to say it, about eight months. And of course the battery was dead, my fault. Threw in another battery, didn't want to start. All right, so let's pull the plugs, take a look at those, replace the plugs, it still didn't want to run right. So drained out the tank, 
it smelled like turpentine. I should have done that first, to tell you the truth. But then I took it out for a ride, and I was like all proud of myself yesterday afternoon. So RPM's coming up, hit about six grand, boom, falls on its face. And the reason being, the fuel filter inside the tank, which is attached to the fuel pump, it was trying to pull, trying like trying to breathe through a very small straw because it was just stopped up and it let a little bit of fuel flow through there, but not enough to really let the engine rev out. <clears throat> so that's going to be your your symptom when uh, your machine didn't want to rev out. It'll run to a certain point and then just just flatten out. That's probably what's having happening is fuel starvation. So. Take advice from me, do as I say, not as I do. When you know your machine's gonna set up for a while, put a battery tender on it before you shut it down. Go ahead and put in some fuel stabilizer, bring that into the system. Make sure your fuel tank is completely full. Otherwise, condensation will actually develop inside of your tank if it's only, you know, if it's not completely full. So once again, other do as I say, not as I do. Otherwise, you'll be spending Oh, another few hundred dollars to bring it back back online again. All right, guys. Well, guess what? I just looked down at the uh, the clock. There went 30 minutes. Well, listen, guys, I just want to say thanks for once again coming in, spending a little time with us, asking me a few questions, trying to keep me on my toes. And we just want to say thanks for shopping here with us at Partzilla, and we'll do our best to uh, get you taken care of uh, now and in the future. Once again, thanks for coming by. God willing, we will see you next Friday at 3 o'clock. Everybody have a good weekend. Once again, remember everything or everyone that uh, was lost you know, 19 years ago. Keep them in your, your thoughts and prayers. Everybody have a great week, and we will see you next weekend or next Friday at 3 o'clock. God bless.